there we go. So Carolina, I'm really delighted that you've accepted to uh, give us this uh, public lecture tonight. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, I will now let you uh, take on the lead in, in talking about your work and taking us through um, this fascinating uh, subject. Thank you so much, Nick. And thank you for the entire um, conference organizing team for inviting me to give this public lecture today. Um, I hope you can see the slides okay, um, and you can hear me okay. If not, please uh, shout or write in the chat. So today I'm going to talk about um, applying cognitive psychology to, um, to teaching and learning. And it's something that is very close to my heart. I have been working on this for many years, and um, I give outreach talks on that topic um, to schools very regularly. And um, so let's unpack first those big words. So what is cognitive psychology to begin with? What are we dealing with when we talk about cognitive psychology? And it is an area in psychology that um, for many years now have looked into how we remember information, when or how we forget information, how we make judgments or how we make decisions. It also looks at um, how we solve problems and all these kinds of different fundamental uh, human abilities and skills and cognitive processes. And for, for the longest time, um, cognitive psychology was doing this in its own kind of world, um, doing fundamental research, lab research, and um, accumulating all those findings. But one thing that really becomes um, and that is really striking is that all those different aspects of human cognition really are important for teaching and learning and can inform teaching and learning strategies in the classroom. And this applies to um, classrooms in, in primary school and in secondary school, but also then in higher education. And it also applies to different disciplines. So it is across different disciplines that these strategies then can be applied. Just to give a bit of an overview on how research is um, conducted and progresses in cognitive psychology. So usually we start off with uh, basic laboratory research where we use very simple materials, uh, we try to get rid of any kind of distraction. We have very controlled conditions just to really try to pin down where the effects are and why the effects occur. Then we venture out and we apply that research um, a bit more. We, we do applied laboratory research, which means we are still in a controlled lab environment, but now, um, we use authentic material, material that is used in classrooms, that, that is used in instruction. And then the final stage is um, the applied classroom research, where we actually go into classrooms where teachers, lecturers implement those strategies and we evaluate their effectiveness. Most importantly, and what's sometimes forgotten, is that loop actually closes back because what we learn from applying something, from applying a strategy, can inform basic research back again. So that's what's the exciting thing about actually leaving the lab, talking to teachers, talking to instructors and lecturers, and see basically what worked out, what did not work out, and maybe what are the things that you really want to know so we can actually start uh, from scratch doing some research on that. So to, today I'm going to give a bit of a, a very rough overview of two of the main strategies in uh, cognitive psychology. In general, you can say there are six very strong strategies that have been investigated for many years and that have back up from lab studies, but also more applied studies in the classroom. Uh, you see the six strategies here, space practice, interleaving, retrieval practice, elaboration, dual coding, and concrete examples. You can roughly categorize those again, saying maybe the first two, these are all about planning. Retrieval practice is about reinforcing knowledge. 
And then the last three is about developing and going more into depth um, with, with knowledge. And so what I'm going to do today, uh, I picked two strategies, um, space practice and retrieval practice, because those have um, the most backup um, in regard to research behind them and have uh, repeatedly been um, already implemented in uh, authentic um, classroom and, and instruction. Okay. Before I start, though, I would like to do the following thing. On the next slide, I will show you two sentences. Okay. I don't want you to write those sentences down, okay, because then it's no fun. So don't write them down, but just try to remember them. Okay. So I will give you just 10 seconds. Okay. So, and for the second activity, what I would like you to do, I'm going to show you a number of words now. Again, please do not write them down at all. Like, otherwise it's really no fun. Um, going to show you those words um, and then we will continue. All right. Okay, that's it. Let's dive in and talk about space practice. Um, so space practice, as I already said, is all about planning. It's about planning and scheduling your teaching or for students to schedule and, um, and plan their study sessions. The main idea of space practice is, is in the very simple, um, the most simple um, scenario that you can have, um, let's say you have two study episodes, okay? One initial study episode where you learn something for the first time, and then a so-called re-study episode where you re revisit that material, okay? So you repeat that material. And then after a certain time, you have a final test on it. Now, what you can do is you can decide to vary the time between one study episode and the next, okay? So you can increase it. So you can say, I study something on a Monday, and I take a, a break of two, two days, and then I restudy it again. And then maybe after a week, I have a test. And you can even increase it further. Um, so you can play around with that interval between one study session and the next study session. And what research has shown, the, the, the general finding is that your long-term retention of knowledge will be increased and will be enhanced if you have more time between one study episode and the next, okay? So just very simply put. So introducing some lags and some spacing and breaks between revisiting old material has been shown to be very effective to maintain that information for a long period of time. The beauty about this effect is that it works for many different domains uh, for text learning, learning in science, learning and problem solving, motor tasks, uh, text learning, so all the different aspects um, can be uh, can be used for all different types of uh, material that you that you learn. The main idea um, stems uh, back to Herman Ebbinghaus in 1885. Um, he um, stated, with any considerable number of repetitions, a suitable distribution of them over space of time is decidedly more advantageous than the massing of them at a single time, okay? So the key is that the total study time stays exactly the same, okay? So let's say you want to invest four hours in studying your material. So um, the only thing that you would do, you would spread it out across time instead of doing everything, let's say in one mass session of four hours, okay? I always like to give some examples from the real world where uh, we might not, even be um, aware that we're already doing this or already experiencing this, but um, it's already happening in daily life. And one example that I love to give is advertising. So let's say you're watching a movie and then there is an um, advert uh, break, right? <clears throat> and you're shown different adverts um, in a row. And what you sometimes uh, 
maybe have noticed is you see, let's say, one advertisement of Haribo, then about a car, then about Legoland, then about some kind of detergent, and then all of a sudden, Haribo again, right? So there's kind of this spacing between an initial teaser of a specific advert, and then other thing happen, and then there is a reactivation of this. And the reason why this is done in advertisement is that if you split your advertising time between two blocks, shorter blocks, but just with more, more space in time in between, people are more likely to remember that advert compared to massing all uh, presentation time into one single um, spot. How does it look like when we research this in, um, in science? So here, I show you this uh, as an example, participants studied uh, a science text and there was a condition where they just read the text once and then they had a test immediately after or two days later. Then there was a condition um, where they were given the opportunity to study the text twice, but there was no break in between the first study episode and the se second study episode. So it was basically mass study, study again, and then again, the test immediately after or two days later. And finally, in this condition, um, they studied the material, but before we studying it again, um, there was a break of one week in between. And then after um, the second study episode, they took a test uh, immediately after or two days uh, later. So we have a single study condition, a mass study condition, and a distributed or spaced um, study condition. What I will show you now is first the result on the immediate test, okay? The test immediately done after they had read um, the material here for the second time um, or in that condition where they just read it once or on the immediate test. What you can see on the immediate test is that participants who had experienced the mass condition, so that who read the material twice in immediate succession, outperformed all the other conditions, okay? So you might then conclude from this, uh, and many students then do, is I will be, do I will be doing massing because massing really seems to work really well um, on, on that immediate test. But what happens? if you test this, this material two days later. Two days later, it turns around. Now the condition that have implemented some kind of distribution between one study episode and the next actually outperforms all the other. I like to show this as an example of, first of all, a strategy like distributed practice works in the long term. It's not, some, not something that is immediately effective. It slows down forgetting in the long term, and you see a better maintenance of knowledge in the long term. And the second thing it shows is it explains a lot why, why students or my, why many students use so-called ineffective learning strategies such as cramming, because it, it really works on the, in, the, in, the, in the short term. Okay, On the very immediate test, they might be able to actually perform to a satisfactory um, performance or even really well. But what happens if, you, if they need that information a week later, a month later, a semester later? It's probably gone. Just uh, to add a second example here um, of solving permutation problems. So they were given letter sequences um, and then they had to determine the number of permutations. Um, there was study session one uh, and the space, the so-called space learners they had five permutation problems here. Then a week later, um, they received another five problems. So um, 10 problems in total spaced across um, one week, five, five problems. The so-called math learners received all 10 problems in one go in one session. So that was really the only difference between those two conditions, between the spacing condition and the math condition. Um, then they had a final test a week later or four weeks um, after practice on completely new permutation problems. What did they find? They found that the participants who had spaced out their practice across a week and split um, the practice uh, across two different sessions, they maintained that information and kept that knowledge over the course of four weeks, 
whereas um, participants who masked everything in a single session, they um, lost more of that knowledge and performed worse on the retention test uh, four weeks later. So some practical tips when it comes to space practice. Um, what, what can we as teachers or what can students do to, um, to, to promote and to support um, uh, space practice? So there are some teacher-led um, activities that can be done. Um, space practice is something that requires planning and structure and so it can be implemented completely in the course structure to so think about when concepts are introduced when are you going to reactivate that concept and to do that in a way that you space out that reactivation across the semester this can be done during class but i know that class uh, time is really precious so it can also be done with asynchronous activities outside of class and assignments in form of quizzes and so on 40 for students, it is about their study habits to tackle their study, study habits and um, their time management. Because it is all about um, uh, time management and planning, um, they might need some help to actually get those schedules um, going and to, um, to help them to scaffold that process. So again, this is just an example of um, a teacher-led approach where you have some lagged homework across the, um, across the different um, semester and year um, where you teach something in, in a specific month, but then you reactivate it in the next month um, with a homework, for example. Um, to support students, again, um, implement some review and study sessions, um, provide them feedback and also encourage peer um, peer group working where they revisit material at later point in time. Um, using space practice is absolutely independent of um, the course format. Um, so probably all of here uh, of you here have experienced um, um, pivoting to online learning. Uh, the good news is that it, because it is all about scheduling, because it is all, um, all about structuring, uh, you can implement it face-to-face -face or online synchronously or asynchronously. So it's very flexible in how you implement it. A quick note on what, what actually happens when um, distribu during distributed practice. Um, we are still looking at different explanations for the effect, why it occurs. Um, one thing um, that we know is that um, we get the best effect of retrieval, or sorry, of distributed practice if that reactivation of, um, of knowledge, right, if that occurs at a point where information, where that knowledge is almost forgotten. So reactivation from a point where it's still possible for the participant or for the student to actually access that information, access that knowledge um, has been uh, shown to be very effective. So leaving more time between one study episode and the next, and then uh, finding that sweet spot where students are still able to access the knowledge and to reconstruct that um, information from, um, from a topic, for example. And it is called under the umbrella of desirable difficulties to introduce some difficulties into learning that uh, make learning a bit more effortful, but still successful. And one way to do that for space uh, practice is, for example, if you have an initial learning session, um, you add a restudy session just very um, briefly after the initial exposure to the material, and then over time, you increase the spacing of reactivation for the students. So Ulrich Neisser once um, stated in Limerick um, that uh, pretty much captures um, the benefits of retrieval, uh, sorry, of distributed practice. And this is it. Um, you can get a good deal from rehearsal if it just has a proper dispersal. You would just be asked to do it en masse. Your remembering would turn out much worse. All right. So let's say we have decided um, that 
um, repetition is, is a good thing to do. Reactivation of knowledge is a good thing to do um, over the course of time when we, we want to space it out and we have made that decision, right? Um, now, in the next step, we could think about what should this repetition look like? How should we repeat material to students or how should a student re repeat material, okay? Um, and this brings us to the main idea of retrieval practice. So in the scenario, you have a study episode in the very beginning, and you have a final test in the very end, okay? And in one scenario, um, students would just restudy the material. So let's say um, they would take their notes, they would reread their notes, they would reread uh, part of the um, book chapter, or um, if they are in class, for example, they could, um, the teacher could explain um, the topic again, show the same slide as a form of reactivation and uh, present part of a previous lecture again. So all these kind of things would just encourage a re-exposure to that material. Or in the second scenario, um, they would take a practice test, okay? So you would um, ask some practice questions that would cover previous material and they would have to um, recall that information from memory and write it down or, or say it out loud. And again, what we find here now is that um, in scenarios where students um, are given the opportunity to retrieve information, previously learned information from memory, their performance on a final test is much better than in a scenario where they just reread that material. Now, if you ask teachers, students, pretty much everyone also in the public, um, what is retrieval practice for? Like what are quizzes good for? What do they do? Um, they will say, oh, you know, a quiz is good because it gives me feedback on what I know and what I don't know yet. Um, it helps me then to understand what I should be focusing on. So it, it gives you a, an idea for study allocation. And it can really be very motivating because, um, you know, if you feel that you can answer many questions, this really is something that uh, makes you feel good and it, it can motivate you to explore the topic further. All these things are definitely aspects um, of quizzing and testing, right? And all these things will, will influence learning performance. So in this case, in this scenario that you see here, retrieval practice has an indirect effect on learning performance. But what most people um, ignore or don't know um, is that retrieval practice itself, so the act of bringing information to mind, of recording information from memory, enhances learning. That is already learning, okay? Um, again, to go back to examples from, uh, from the real world, from daily life, um, there are different um, situations where we have engaged repeatedly in retrieval practice. And because we have done so, we remember that information much better. One example is phone numbers. I'm pretty sure the only phone number that you remember by heart is, the, is your own, because that's the one that you repeatedly recall from memory to tell other people. Uh, back when, when uh, in the 90s, uh, I would call all my friends and I would take too much time to actually go and look up the information, the phone number. So I would repeatedly uh, punch in the number and um, recall the number from memory. I still remember those numbers today, even though they have no use for me, right? It's so ingrained because I have done this retrieval so often in my life before. Another example is uh, maps or navigation. Um, Google Maps, absolutely fantastic tool, but um, you could end up punching in um, the way from A to B repeatedly the same, the same route um, without ever really knowing how to get there because you rely um, on Google Maps to, be, to guide you there. And what you don't do is you don't pay attention to the actual external cues that could help you to memorize and to remember the information um, in the future for you to be completely um, independent from using Google Maps for, to, for, to, forget, um, to get from A to B, right? So um, 
before Google Maps, you would uh, maybe use your ma normal map before, and then you would take it away because it would be too, too much of a hassle. And then you would use your memory to recall bits of the, of the route um, here and there. And in the end, you would, you would know it by heart. Another example are um, the lyrics from songs, for example. So again, how is it um, investigated in, um, in the lab here? Um, that's already a classic um, study in this area. Um, they had students uh, repeatedly reading uh, a science text um, four times. So that's the blue condition here. Or in the green group, they read the text once and then they performed a brain dump, which means they had to write um, everything from memory uh, on a bent piece of paper that, that they could um, recall and remember from the text. So this, these were the two um, conditions. After engaging in this, um, the participants were asked, so if you had to predict how well you will do on the test, let's say two days later, what would be your prediction? How well will you do? And this is what I'm going to show you first. So participants who engage in repeated reading, they have the feeling that they are taking in a lot of information. And if you ask them right after studying like that, they will give a quite high prediction of how well they would do on the, on the future test compared to a condition that read it only once and then had to do a brain dump. Those um, people, are much more um, unsecure about their knowledge because retrieving from memory feels very effortful. It feels like you're not really taking in as much information. You're not really as, um, um, as confident um, uh, what you got right and if, if, if you got all the information out, right? But what happens now on the later tests in, when you actually measure the performance on the test? It is the complete other way around. The participants who engaged in at least one round of retrieval practice from retrieving from memory outperform participants who have read the material over and over again. The final study I would like to show you is, um, is this one here when it comes to new learning. I like to show this one because it is an uh, area that is currently being more, more and more investigated in cognitive psychology. And that really shows that retrieval practice is not only effective to reinforce previously learned material, but it can also prepare the learner for new uh, input. So in this um, study, uh, participants watched a 20 minute stats lecture and it was um, divided into four different segments of five minutes each. In the so-called tested condition, uh, they watched five minutes of the first segment. Uh, so segment one was five minutes. So they watched five minutes of the lecture. And then they did a quiz on that first uh, segment. So on those five minutes. Then they watched um, the second segment, another five minutes and took a quiz on that segment. And then they watched the third segment, another five minutes and then took again a quiz. The restudy condition, um, the only difference here was that after watching the five minutes, they did a restudy um, activity. So they looked at their notes and they restudied the material. So they, they, they were re-exposed to the material and re-read the material. And they did this for all three segments. And in the so-called control condition, they just watched the, the segment, but did not engage in any further activity. Okay, all right. So what were they interested in? They were interested what happens in the fourth and last segment. So all participants after watching the um, last five minutes received a quiz on that last segment, okay? So the first thing they were interested in is to see how do people perform on that very last quiz on that segment number four, depending on the different conditions they were in. Then they were interested in mind wandering. So after each segment, um, students were asked whether they experienced mind wandering. And mind wandering is this phenomenon where you're paying attention, you're seemingly being, being paying attention to a task. It could be you're reading something or watching something. And then all of a sudden your mind drifts away 
And then you come back and kind of, I don't even know where I went, right? I don't know how long I was gone for. Um, but during that time, you're not really taking in any information. That's a problem when, when you are trying to encode and learn uh, new information. So uh, mind wandering, um, they had to say whether they experienced mind wandering during that, um, those five minutes uh, of each segment or not. And the last thing that they measured is uh, the note taking. So how many notes students were taking. So let's look at the results. So the first thing I'm going to show you is um, on the very right side here is the number of correct responses on the final quiz for the fourth segment, okay? And what we see here is that students who were continuously tested on all previous segments before performed better on the quiz on the final segment. And that is the effect, this forward testing effect, this effect that continuously quizzing can enhance and prepare you better for new learning. These students also took more notes than students um, in any other of the conditions. And they reported less mind wandering than students who had restudied the material or did not engage in any activity after the five minute se segments. So, it's a forward testing effect. It prepares for new learning. It opens resources, mental resources for preparing um, new, uh, new learning. Students are more likely to take in information to experience uh, less mind wandering and to take more notes. What are some practical tips? Um, when implementing retrieval practice, quizzes, tests in your, um, in your classroom or when students are implementing it, Always keep in mind what are the actual pro processes that are being triggered um, that uh, are be being benefited from retrieval practice. And I will um, highlight them in, in a second. Uh, always think about different processes between different students. And again, uh, we can think about, uh, does it matter in what environment you're teaching? So let's talk about the cognitive processes first. Um, what is really important is, and what's the key aspect, is this effortful but successful retrieval of that material. So from retrieving information and knowledge from memory, um, memory traces are strengthened. You create multiple access to that information for the future. And that is basically what, what the main driving process is. It is this effortful retrieval. If retrieval is too easy, it won't have the same effect. If retrieval is not successful, if it fails, it will also be, be, be not um, as effective. So we want to actually have them to work a bit to have this effortful process of retrieving information from memory. And this can be done by with many different types of quizzes. Um, short answer questions, for example, is something that has very powerful um, engagement of these retrieval processes. So they can be very nicely used just, you know, short question and require them to remember that information from memory and write it down or say it out loud. Um, what about uh, multiple choice quest, uh, questions? Uh, usually a bad reputation in some way because you're already giving out the answer in the question. However, uh, research shows it really depends on how you create your answer alternatives. So if the student is really required to um, to retrieve different information for the, for the different answer alternatives to identify the correct answer, um, then they are engaging in that effortful retrieval process. And um, in that case, multiple choice questions can really help as well. Um, so really asking them to identify why one alternative is wrong and why another one is the correct one for that specific um, question. Um, retrieval practice, again, then involves that effortful process. And that can mean very different things to different learners uh, with different ability levels, um, with different prior knowledge. So it's always good to keep in mind where students are coming from and to scaffold that process so that they can actually achieve that, um, that stage where they can retrieve that information from memory. As with space practice, it works for many, many different course formats, okay? I do retrieval practice in 
pretty much all my, uh, my classes in, in form of uh, whole class response systems using Mentimeter or any kind of forms. I use them as asynchronous quizzes, uh, as, as take home quizzes uh, for students. And I have students generate their own questions um, on which I provide very quick feedback if they are asking questions on the level that uh, would be expected, let's say for an exam. Okay, to end um, this part on a quote by Aras Aristotle, uh, he stated, um, exercise and repeatedly recalling a thing strengthens the memory. So already we are. Okay. All right, so remember those, um, remember those uh, sentences I asked you to remember in the very beginning. What I want you to do now is um, go to Mentimeter. Um, so there's, you can scan this on your phone or I will also post the link here in the chat. And I would, what I want you to do is um, to answer the question. So um, recall the sentence. Ah, I see ants are coming in. The hungry python ate the mouse, caught the mouse, devoured the house, something about the mouse, <laughs> uh, caught, caught the brown mouse. Ate the mouse, ate the car keys, ate the mouse. Uh -huh, keep them coming. Anything else? Eight, eight, eight. All right. Okay. Then I'm getting to the second question. The absent minded professor. How did that continue? Lost his car key. Didn't have his car key, forgot his car key, lost, couldn't find. Misplaced. All right. Okay. Okay. So, um, the hungry python ate the mouse. That was quite a few of you said that. Um, or the absent minded professor lost, left, forgot his car keys. This was not what the sentence said. The sentence said, caught the mouse, I think one person got it right, and then didn't have his uh, car keys. Why do I do this exercise? I like to do that because um, it is a good demonstration about a reconstruction of memory. So our memories, the way it works is, um, there's never a one-to-one -one on how we perceived it and what we recall later. What we usually do is really a reconstruction of uh, memory and, and we use that. And every time we recall information, we do this reconstruction over and over again, which means that over time, there will always be slightly changes in, in how we recall the information. Okay, just to keep, um, keep on that um, Mentimeter slide. All right, um, you learned a word list. Uh, was this word in the list, toast? Okay. How confident are you about the answer that you just gave? Okay, very confident. Okay, next word. Was this word in the list trash?
Okay. How confident are you that your answer you just gave about trash? Okay, a rating of four. And then finally, the last one, was this word in the list, dumpster? Okay. And again, for the last time, how confident are you in your answer you just gave? Okay, so less confident about this one, uh, pretty confident about um, the fresh one, and um, also pretty confident about the toast one. So let's look at uh, the result. Okay, so these are the three words that I just asked you about. This is the word list that I gave you to study. Toast and trash were not in the list, okay? You were right with toast, but you were not right with trash because most of you actually said that trash was in the list when in fact it was never presented to you. So what, what, what happened here? What happened is that I gave you a list that was semantically related and all related to, to garbage, to, to, to trash, and all pointed somehow to trash and activated the word trash without the actual, uh, actual word being in the list. Uh, in addition to that, I made it a bit harder as well uh, by adding some words in the list that rhymed with trash um, that also gave an addition activation for the word trash. So I built and constructed and implemented, um, planted that memory in you that trash was in the list when in fact it was never shown to you. Again, what it shows is the malleability of memory, the reconstruction that happens with memory, and um, that this is something that can be a, can be, can be um, a beneficial thing when it comes to you know, this effortful process to reconstruct in, uh, memory and to uh, remember and do ritual practice, but it can also um, influence and um, inform memories. And so it's always important to um, to receive feedback and to, um, to make sure that we're recording the right thing. Just to wrap up some resources, um, a very quick note about metacognition. Metacognition is um, just like the idea that um, we want to monitor our knowledge about our own knowledge. And um, that helps us to, to see what we have understood, we have not understood and so on. But what we know from research is that we shouldn't ask this question, for example, to students if they have understood the topic, for example, right after you have taught that topic, because then everything is fresh in their mind. They have never really tried to retrieve it from memory. And so the, the tip here is to wait, to delay these questions, to require the learner to retrieve specific details from memory first, and then to ask them how well they have understood um, the material. This gives them a better metacognitive judgment of their um, abilities and their understanding. To wrap up, um, previously uh, revised previously taught material after some time increase the gaps from one uh, session to the next of revision. Do it via um, quizzing with feedback instead of rereading or representing the material to, uh, to students. Um, optimize the effective um, processes. It's very highly adaptable to different disciplines, different um, uh, ways on how you teach and never forget to scaffold and um, provide structure. More information on these techniques uh, can be found on the Tile Network uh, website. It's mm -hmm. one that I lead and that um, I always invite students to write blog posts but also invite um, teachers and lecturers to share the best practice. And we have a monthly speaker series that uh, we, um, we do online on, um, on Zoom. Um, there are the learning scientists. Um, we do a lot of outreach activities. We write blog, uh, blog, blog posts, podcasts. Uh, we record a podcast and have posters on those different strategies. 
and on the way to be implemented right away. All right, that's it from my, from my side. Thank you very much. Um, and um, do you have any questions? Well, thank you very much, uh, Carolina. I, uh, it was really a, a great and entertaining talk and uh, really fascinating insight into how our memory works and how it can be uh, tricked into believing a few things. Uh, certainly, my, my memory was uh, not doing so well, uh, it seems. So um, a big round of applause. Um, virtual or real uh, up to everyone uh, for your for your fantastic talk thank you so i'm encouraging everyone to put their questions in the chats um, and i will uh, read them um, uh, so let's let's see if um, we have some questions uh, i i had um, perhaps i can start with one question i was wondering if you had um, any um, uh, insight into how the, the sort of, for instance, for the spaced repetition, if the lag between the different stages of study and the test depend on the complexity of the topic and, and whether you know, we, we should think about different uh, lags uh, for first year undergraduate students and for yeah. master's level students, for instance. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, that's an absolutely great question. And it has not really been investigated uh, in depth as it should. The complexity of material, for example, um, is one that from a theoretical point of view, you would expect uh, different lags definitely uh, to be more optimal for, you know, um, if material is, is easier to understand, you would expect that you could leave more time before reactivation um, re compared to more complex, which you might want to revisit earlier. But there is not really a good study that has tested this directly because it's really hard to um, to manipulate uh, complexity of material. Um, for retrieval practice, we have some insight in regards to um, learner abilities. So we know that for younger children, for example, um, you have to provide more scaffolding and uh, for them to actually engage in that retrieval of that knowledge. Um, so a brain dump for, I don't know, seven to eight year old will not work as well. They usually need more um, cues that they then fill in uh, with the information from memory. So you have to give more cues there. The moment you do provide those cues though, um, they benefit um, as, um, as well from retrieval practice as um, adults, for example. Yeah. Thank you. Um, there was one uh, question here about um, do these techniques, uh, techniques also work for, uh, for skills? Motor and otherwise, yes. Um, so there are studies that show um, it works for problem solving skills, for example. Um, there are studies um, that, I, there are a very recent one that looked at space practice and video gaming. Um, so um, they had like a complex uh, video game that they um, uh, programmed and then they had um, participants uh, practice the video game with different spacing they also found a, um, an effect um, increase in performance for, for participants who, um, who were in a spaced schedule compared to a math schedule. Um, so it worked in there. There is some limited uh, research on music um, and for, for example piano playing um, and um, spacing for example. So uh, we need much more research there because there's one study that actually showed effects on uh, space practice specifically. There was another one, a more recent one that did not show any effects. However, their uh, test interval was very short. And one thing that we know from retrieval, uh, sorry, from space practice is that it really works better for the long term. Um, so something that should be uh, further investigated. Um, there's one question about uh, the move to open book examinations in universities. Mm -hmm. uh, did you modify any aspect of retrieval practice as the students can look up answers during the test? So I'm, I'm a big fan of open book um, exams actually, um, because I'm, I'm able as a lecturer to ask more in depth and complex questions that um, where students have to use um, their knowledge and apply that knowledge for more complex um, situations. Um, so I'm 
with uh, closed book exams, I always felt that it's more really about fact, fact learning and just like listing those facts. Now with the open book exams, I was really able to get um, to obtain a better um, a, a better measure of students the in depth understanding because students were still um, they still needed to have this this knowledge in mind um, so they still had to use their knowledge because um, they have to understand how different theories connect to each other how do different findings connect to different theories and then they had to use that knowledge and apply it to um, to the question in in the exam. And most importantly, what I found was really interesting uh, because it was open book, they could use all their uh, papers and resources and could, could add that as additional evidencing um, of their answers and of their claims, um, which I think made for very, very strong exam answers. Um, and you could actually see differences in quality as well of students who did this better compared to others who struggled a bit more to actually get together the different links between knowledge. And thank you. Um, there's a question about the, what are the common kind of external factors that negatively impact memory or interfere with space practice? How could we identify or mitigate these? So I'm trying to find the answer right now. Which one is that? Um, we have different studies. Study, practice, test, test, being better for learning than study, you study, test. That's the following question. Oh, um, Jesse, if, if which one do you just want the reference? So yeah, I can give you the reference. You just uh, email me. I can I can send you the paper. Um, what are common kind of external factors that negatively impact memory or interfere with space practice? How could we? Um, so negatively impact external factors. What do you mean by external factors? So um, I guess any barriers against uh, you know the well the students' abilities, for instance, or anyone's ability in, in that respect to so uh, memorize thing, facts. Yeah. Um, I think the only thing I can think right now, I think of right now, if you, for example, have some spacing between, you know, um, initially uh, teaching a specific topic or concept, let's say, and then have some spacing in between and then reactivate it. What could happen in between, they might find some um, information that maybe contradict that, um, that first, you know, uh, your first explanation of that concept um, that could then uh, in some way interfere with um, that memory trace that was formed to actually understand that concept in the first or to, to, uh, to have that memory for that um, first information. Um, and then uh, when you do uh, a, a reactivation of that, of that concept um, and you, for example, do it through, uh, through a quiz, you will find out any misconception that may, may have been formed and, and will be able to actually um, to give them feedback and to um, and to identify this. I think the best way to identify any kind of misconceptions, let's say, that maybe happen between you know those kind of spacing intervals, is um, through a quiz and then through feedback. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, and perhaps a related or slightly connected question is the uh, the following question for the study where students are given quizzes after five minutes segment has this been tried for longer lectures and is there a maximum time before mental fatigue sets in yeah um so usually when you um i, I don't know any study by heart right now but what you usually find is that um any quite those quizzes that is with interpolated quizzes that um you provide during lectures they actually um decrease fatigue in students okay because then suddenly they don't have they come from this more passive stage of listening to an active stage to do something and this um this change in in in, in activity um that actually increase um, decreases their fatigue um, and this is something that i have also um evidenced in my own teaching particularly on zoom um when i do those quizzes in between um 
in my student evaluations, they were all kind of, oh, and then, you know, it's like the time where you can actually uh, take in the information and use that information again and see how much you have actually understood. And this keeps me concentrated. So um, those quizzes between a lecturer has, um, has usually a, a reactivation um, effect on attention um, for students. Great, thanks. Well, I think that that's all the questions and, and indeed we should perhaps uh, give you some uh, time now to, to relax. Thank you <laughs> very much for uh, answering all the questions and for this fantastic presentation. So again, big round of applause from uh, everyone. Uh, so I will stop the recording just now and uh, I would also like to thank our sponsors for the Weisweg conference.